In this video, which is going to be a little bit longer than usual, and I apologize in advance, you may want to skip through some of the review sections, or you may just want to pause after 20 minutes. We're going to talk about a new concept. And in this course, we have a lot of vocabulary, and this is a heck of a word right here. Diagonalizability. We're talking about, is a matrix diagonalizable? And how is that connected to eigenspaces? Well, let's define diagonalizable. Matrix A has to be a square matrix. It's diagonalizable if there's an invertible matrix C, such that when you multiply on the left by C inverse and on the right by C, the resulting product is a diagonal matrix D. So by multiplying by C and C inverse, you get a diagonal matrix. And that's what it means by diagonalizable. So let's see if we can see how that is connected to eigenspaces with an example. So uh, this example has fractions in it, but it turns out that we shouldn't be afraid of fractions, uh, and particularly in this case, because they all have a common denominator. So we're gonna start by factoring out the one half, and then the matrix that's left over with integer entries, we're gonna call that matrix B. And it's not cheating. Uh, we're gonna work with the matrix B and find its eigenvalues and eigenvectors because there's that clean connection between matrix A and matrix B, that uh, matrix A is half of matrix B. And if we find eigenvalues and eigenvectors of B, then I can multiply both sides of this eigenpair equation by one half. Now one half of B is the matrix A, and so that would tell me that a times v is half of lambda times v. So if I know the eigenvalues of b, then I can find the eigenvalues of a by just multiplying the, those eigenvalues of b by one half. And the eigenvectors don't have to change at all. Any eigenvector of b is also an eigenvector of a. So let's calculate the eigenvalues. We're going to have to start with the characteristic polynomial and set it equal to zero. That'll give us the characteristic equation. Uh, it does help to think ahead and uh, look at some of the algebra. So here I have used expansion by minors, and I see that I have a negative three multiplier in front of this minor, as well as uh, a negative three in front of the last minor. So I can factor that out. And then super bonus is that everything inside the brackets here adds up to zero. So I'm just left with really this first uh, entry times its minor. And uh, that's easy to, to factor <coughs> once we collect the like terms. And so we can find the uh, eigenvalues of B are one, Four and negative four. Uh, I'm really not that interested in the eigenvalues of A for this example, but if I want to find them, I just multiply those eigenvalues by one half, and I've got the eigenvalues of A. Let's find the eigenvectors. Remember, the eigenvectors <coughs> uh, of B are the same as the eigenvectors of A. So if I find a basis for an eigenspace of B, it's also a basis for an eigenspace of A. So we'll start with lambda uh, 1 equals 1. We have to solve this homogeneous system of equations. And uh, you know we want to get into the habit, uh, if possible, to see if, if we can just determine a solution uh, by inspection. In other words, you know, thinking about you know, a linear combination of these columns, of uh, this matrix is there an obvious linear combination which will add up to zero and uh, yeah if you multiply each column by one and then add them up you get the zero vector what about uh, lambda 2 equals 4 again we're going to go ahead and solve this uh, homogeneous linear system uh, if you can't see a combination by inspection then by all means, you want to uh, transform it to reduced row echelon form. Uh, 
But here uh, you can get that a solution is uh, 1, 0, negative 1. Just take the first column, subtract the third column, and just zero out the second column, and you'll get the zero vector. So uh, that is another uh, eigenvector. It's an eigenvector corresponding to 4. And then for uh, our last one, uh, I guess that should have been lambda 3, uh, equal to negative 4. Um, we're going to go ahead and solve this homogeneous system of equations. And again, if it's not clear, we could go ahead and uh, transform it to reduce to echelon form. But here you can see that if you add the second and third columns, you get 0. So go ahead and 0 out the first column. So now we've got uh, bases for eigen all eigenspaces, or we've got three eigenvectors corresponding to different eigenspaces. How does this connect to diagonalization? Well, let's start with the definition. That means we have an invertible matrix C where C inverse A, C equals a diagonal matrix. I can go ahead and multiply that equation on the, and I should have said on the left, on the left by C, on the left by C, and I'll get the equation AC equals CD. Now, if I look at this AC equals CD more carefully, we're going to see the connection to the uh, eigenspaces. But before we do that, let's do some review about matrix vector and matrix matrix multiplication. Um, Let's start with an example. We're going to use the same matrix B, and we're just going to pick a vector X with entries 2, 3, 4. Now, X doesn't have any connection to our previous example. Uh, it has no connection to the eigenvectors or eigenspaces. It's just chosen to help illustrate uh, how we can view matrix vector multiplication. So generally, the way we learn how to do matrix vector multiplication is we take a dot product of the row with that column, and that'll give us the entries in the product. And so let's go ahead and form those dot products, but not collect any like terms. And you can see, we've talked about this many times, that this is going to give us what we've been calling a column-centric view of matrix vector multiplication. Now, in other words, that the matrix vector product is a linear combination of the columns of the matrix. And the coefficient comes from, or the coefficients come from the corresponding entries in, or components in the vector. So now, if we just look at B as having three columns, B1, B2, 3, then the matrix vector product Bx is just x1 times B1 plus x2 times B2 plus x3 times B3. All right, so that's important, and we've reviewed that a lot. Here's something that we haven't talked about as much, but it's really useful. So we're going to form b times v. So we're going to take the matrix b and we're going to multiply it on the right by a matrix v, which has three columns. And the way we're going to think of v is we'll partition it column-wise. So we'll just write v as having three column vectors, v1, v2, and v3. So when I multiply b times v, I can just think of that as multiplying b times each column separately. So if I take b times the first column, I'll get the first column of the product. And take b times the second column, I'll get the second column of the product. And of course, if I take the b times the third column, I get the third column of the product. So I can write this product in this way and it's really a nice way of thinking about it. You can think of distributing B across the multiplication of B across all of the columns. So you get a, a product that has three columns. The first column is B times V1, and the second one is B times V2, and the third one is B 
times v3. So the last review is matrix, matrix multiplication, where we're going to multiply the matrix v on the right by a diagonal matrix. And if you remember that, it's a very simple operation. But let's just review it. Uh, well, again, we're going to have three columns, v1, v2, and v3. And we're going to take the diagonal matrix D to have our eigenvalues. So here is our matrix V with the actual entries in it. These are the eigenvectors that we calculated. These are the eigenvalues along the diagonal entry. We're going to form this product. Well, if I use my column-centric view, I would take a linear combination So, uh, of the... Uh, combinations of V. So for the first column, I would use the first column of D, use those as my coefficients, and take a linear combination of the columns of V. Well, because it's a diagonal matrix, there's only one component in this first column vector, which is not zero. So really in this linear combination, the only thing I'm interested in is the component that is non-zero, which is the first component. So I'll wind up taking the first uh, component, multiplying it times the first column. That gives me the first column in the product matrix. Same idea in the for the second column. I'm going to take a linear combination, but again, my coefficients here are zero, except for this second component here. So really, I'm only interested in what is the product of that second component times the second column of V. That gives me the second column of my product. And the same idea with the third. Again, only the third component is non-zero. So when I take my linear combination, the other ones are zero. So I just have that third component times the third column of V gives me the third column of the product. So what have we done? In order to find the columns of the product, we just multiplied each column of V by its corresponding diagonal entry of D. So multiplying V times D, I just took 1 times the first column, 4 times the second column, negative 4 times the third column, and those form the columns of the product matrix. So it's very simple to perform that multiplication. But it's pretty easy then to see that, oh, if we want to write this out, multiplying v times d, the product is just, well, lambda 1 times v1 in the first column, lambda 2 v2 in the second column, and lambda 3 v3 in the third column. So let's put these ideas together and we'll see the connection to diagonalizability. So let's start with our three eigenvalue eigenvector equations for our matrix B. Now we can condense this into matrix form having one column per equation. So I have B times V1 equals lambda 1 V1 b times v2 equals lambda 2 v2, b times v3 equals lambda 3 v3. And now you can see where we're going. On the left-hand side, I can factor out the b. And the right-hand side is just the matrix v times that diagonal matrix with diagonal entries lambda 1, lambda 2, and lambda 3. Or I could even condense this even further. This just says b times v equals v times d. d is that diagonal matrix. And now if, here we have the connection now to diagonalizability, if v is invertible, because now we didn't start out with any assumption about v being invertible. We're just saying that if we have those three eigenvalue, eigenvector equations, then we can write it in this form. And now we have to make this big assumption that if the matrix V is invertible, 
then we can say the matrix B is diagonalizable with V inverse BV equaling D. So what will we need? Well, if we have N linearly independent eigenvectors with corresponding eigenvalues lambda 1 through lambda N, we can write those n eigenvalue eigenvector equations in compact form as being av equals v times d. v has columns, it's eigenvectors, d is the diagonal matrix of the eigenvalues. Now, here is the big if, or the suppose. We suppose that n has n, or I mean a has n linearly independent eigenvectors. That means the columns of the square matrix V are linearly independent, which means V must be invertible, and then we can conclude that A is diagonalizable, that V inverse AV equals D. So the big supposition there was that the matrix had n linearly independent eigenvectors. And so now we need to answer, if we want to know when a matrix is diagonalizable, when does it have n linearly independent eigenvectors? And we know that the answer is not always. Uh, if we think back to the uh, shear matrices, we found that they only have one linearly independent eigenvector. So they're two by two matrices, but only one linearly independent eigenvector. Uh, and so uh, not all matrices are diagonalizable. But in our first example, we found that the eigenvectors corresponding to the eigenvalues, which were all different from each other, formed a linearly independent set. And uh, we can think about that a little bit. That's such an important idea. Let's see if we can come up with an explanation. Uh, so suppose we have two eigenvalues, which are different from each other, and their corresponding eigenvectors. Now, we're going to do a proof by contradiction. We're going to assume that that set, V1, V2, is linearly dependent. Now, neither v1 nor v2 can be a zero vector, so that means that there has to be a non-zero constant c where v1 equals c times v2. So let's do some algebra. Let's take our av2 equals lambda 2 v2 and just multiply both sides by c. But then also we know that v1 we assume equals c2 times v2, so I can make that substitution uh, on the left-hand side here. So I get these two equations. And I notice that the left-hand side is identical. And so I can subtract them. And when I subtract on the left-hand side, I get the zero vector. And well, look at this. Uh, remember, we assumed that v1 was c times v2. So make that substitution here. And what do you come up with? Well, I have a common factor of c. I'll factor that one out on the left. A common factor of the v2 vector. I'll factor that on the right. In the parentheses, I have lambda 2 minus lambda 1. And that's supposed to equal the 0 vector. Well, that's impossible. Why? Well, c cannot equal 0, because neither v1 nor v2 can be the 0 vector. Uh, lambda 2 minus lambda 1 can equal 0 because we assume that lambda 2 was different from lambda 1. And of course, the vector v2 can't be the 0 vector because it's an eigenvector. So we have come to a contradiction, and so our proof by contradiction implies that if I have a set of two eigenvectors corresponding to different eigenvalues, that set must be linearly independent. But what if I have more than two? Well, Suppose I have three eigenvalues uh, that are all different from each other with their corresponding eigenvectors. And we'll do another proof by contradiction. If this set v1, v2, v3 is linearly independent, we can go ahead and write v3 as 
C1, V1 plus C2, V2. Remember, none of those vectors can be the zero vector. Now we do some algebra. So we know that uh, A times v3 would be lambda 3 times v3, but instead of v3, I can put c1 v1 plus c2 v2. But I also know that if I multiply a times v1, I get lambda 1 v1, and if I multiply a times v2, I get lambda 2 v2. So let's go ahead and do a subtraction like we did before. And what do we get here? Let's look at that equation a little bit more carefully. I have v1 times some number plus v2 times some other number, which gives me a zero vector. Now, neither c1 nor c2 is zero. Uh, well, not both of them are zero, excuse me. Neither, I can't have both c1 and c2 equal to zero. And certainly lambda 3 minus lambda 1 and lambda 3 minus lambda 2 can't be zero because the eigenvalues are all different. So what do we come up with then? This is a non-trivial linear combination of v1 and v2, which equals zero. So that would say that the set v1, v2 would be linearly dependent. That would be two eigenvectors corresponding to two eigenvalues being linearly dependent. Well, we just showed that that can't be true. So our, we've got another contradiction. So that tells me that if you have a set of three eigenvectors, then corresponding to different eigenvalues, they have to be linearly independent. And we can just continue this process. Um, if you have, uh, a, if you make the assumption that any set of k eigenvectors corresponding to k different eigenvalues is linearly independent, then you can show that using the same type of argument, that it, if you have k plus 1 eigenvectors corresponding to k plus 1 different eigenvalues, that that set must also be linearly independent. This type of proof uh, is an example of proof by induction. And within that proof, we were also using proof by contradiction. So in the end, what we can say is that any set of eigenvectors corresponding to different eigenvalues must be linearly independent. And so if I have n distinct eigenvalues, so if all of the eigenvalues of A are different, then I have n linearly independent eigenvectors. So the eigenvector matrix would be invertible and the matrix A would be diagonalizable we would have v inverse a v equals d. So what we can say, we still have to learn a little bit more, is that if a matrix is not diagonalizable, then it must have repeated eigenvalues. Now repeated eigenvalues doesn't doom the matrix to being not diagonalizable. Certainly it's true about shear matrices, right? They have repeated eigenvalues lambda equals 1, but only one linearly independent eigenvector. But you have plenty of 2 by 2 matrices that where you have two linearly independent eigenvectors. And a simple example is your uh, scaling uh, transformation. Its standard matrix is just k times the identity. And so you could use uh, your standard basis vectors as a basis for your eigenspace and um, corresponding to the value lambda equals k. So it has two linearly independent eigenvectors. So just having a repeated eigenvalue doesn't doom the matrix to being not diagonalizable. Let's look at a 3 by 3 example. Let's look at two of them and try to see what the difference is. So we're going to try to find a basis for the non-trivial eigenspaces of this matrix. It's an upper triangular matrix. We don't really need to solve the characteristic equation to find the eigenvalues. We know the eigenvalues are going to be 3, 3, and 1. But just to write out the characteristic equation here, I have 3 minus lambda squared times 1 minus lambda equals 0. And so sure enough, I have two different eigenvalues, 
lambda equals 3 has multiplicity 2. And so since it has a repeated root, a, re a root with multiplicity 2 or higher, uh, we don't know if it has three uh, linearly independent eigenvectors. We're going to have to find out. We're going to have to actually calculate them. So let's go ahead and uh, calculate a basis for the null space of a minus 3i. Uh, I am uh, going to do this a little bit more carefully uh, because I really want to make sure I know how many free variables so I know the dimension of the null space. So here I only have one free variable. And so uh, it's pretty easy to see that uh, 1, 0, 0 uh, would be in the null space of this matrix. And so that would be the eigenvector corresponding to uh, lambda equals 3. And what about for lambda equals 1? Uh, again, I transform it to uh, reduced row echelon form. I see that there's only one free uh, variable, so the dimension is only one. And I'm wondering if I can uh, look at this and figure out, I think if, if I take uh, one minus one, one, yeah, that will give me a vector in the null space. Or I could just cite it, read it from the reduced row echelon form. Uh, which tells me that, uh, look, I only have two linearly independent eigenvectors. I got one from lambda equals 3 and one from lambda equals 1. So this particular matrix is not diagonalizable. So let's look at a second matrix. This is matrix B. It's a different matrix from the B that we used before. Still upper triangular. We can still read that it has the same eigenvalues. In fact, it has the same characteristic equation. So since it has the same characteristic equation, does that mean it's going to have the same number of eigenvectors? Well, let's find out. All right, we got two eigenvalues, same as before. Let's go ahead and transform b minus 3i. And now here, again, I did it uh, very carefully uh, because, oh, I can see that I have only one leading variable. I have two free variables. And so let's, uh, I'm not even going to sight read this one. I'm going to go ahead and look at this carefully. V3 is free. Uh, V1 is free as well. I only have a one in the second column. So that's my only leading variable. So finding the general solution, I can write it as r times 1, 0, 0, plus t times 0, negative 1, 1. And a little quick sanity check. Uh, if I multiply this b minus 3i times 1, 0, 0, of course I get 0. And if I multiply it times 0, negative 1, 1. So you have to be careful sometimes. You could have just jumped to conclusions and said, oh, there's only one eigenvector. It's 1, 0, 0, but uh, there's actually two linearly independent eigenvectors. And here's a quick check. I went, I went ahead and multiplied that out to make sure that those are indeed in the null space. I did not make any arithmetic errors. All right, so that means we have two. The dimension of this eigenspace is two. I have two linearly independent eigenvectors corresponding to lambda equals three. For lambda equals 1, I'm going to go ahead and uh, see here I get a little help because this third row implies that 2v3 equals 0. So v3 has to equal 0, right? And so v3 equals 0, I can see that if I take v1 equals 1 and v2 equals 1, then I get 1 plus 1 equals 0. Again, you may want to uh, go ahead and use the reduced row echelon form to verify that the dimension, that you only get one free variable, so the dimension is 1. But in totality, we had two linearly independent eigenvectors corresponding to lambda equals 3 and one corresponding to lambda equals 1. And so I've got three linearly independent eigenvectors, and B then 
must be diagonalizable. It's a three by three matrix with three linearly independent eigenvectors. So what's the difference between our matrices A and B? We have the same characteristic equation. They have the same eigenvalues with the same multiplicities, but the difference is the dimension of the eigenspace corresponding to the repeated root. For A, the dimension of that eigenspace was 1, but for B, the dimension was 2. And the multiplicity of this eigenvalue as a uh, solution to the characteristic equation was 2, so it matched the dimension of the eigenspace. So we have to distinguish between two types of multiplicities. We have the standard multiplicity, which is what we call algebraic multiplicity because it comes from the solution of the algebraic equation, the characteristic equation. How many times is it repeated? That is its algebraic multiplicity. But then we also have another type of multiplicity, which is the dimension of its eigenspace. So formally, if I have an eigenvalue of an n by n matrix, the algebraic multiplicity, and we're going to put an m sub a for algebraic multiplicity of lambda, is the multiplicity of lambda as a root of the characteristic equation. The dimension of the eigenspace, we're going to call that the geometric multiplicity. So m sub g of lambda, that's the dimension of that eigenspace. So what do we need then in order to have n linearly independent eigenvectors? We need for each eigenvalue that the dimension of the eigenspace is the same as the algebraic multiplicity. That is, the geometric multiplicity has to equal the algebraic multiplicity, and that has to be true for each eigenvalue. And then linearly independent eigenvectors is equivalent to being diagonalizable, because then that eigenvector matrix is invertible, and we can go from the AV equals VD to V inverse AV equals D. Now, I'm going to finish up here with a word of caution. We have two bulls. We have invertible and diagonalizable. These concepts are completely unrelated. Those notions are not connected in any way. So you could have a matrix, like a shear matrix. It's invertible, but not diagonalizable. You could have a matrix, like a scaling matrix, which is both invertible and diagonalizable. You could have the matrix of all zeros, a square matrix of all zeros. That's diagonalizable. It's already diagonal, but it's not invertible. And then you could have a matrix like, well, let me just, we saw this in a, in a previous video. You could have a matrix like A, which is 0, 1, 0, 0. This is not invertible, obviously, right? It has zero entries on the diagonal. And it's also not diagonalizable. I'm going to need a new line to write out that word, diagonal. So all four cases are possible. There's just simply no connection at all between the idea of invertible and diagonalizable.